The Let's Talk podcast was inspired by the MISD's leadership and empowerment team, or LET for short. Our mission is to ensure that all students, regardless of race, culture, or gender, have an equitable learning environment so they can become the leaders they want to be. And now, here are your hosts, Daniel Norwood and Ted Madden. Welcome to episode four of the Let's Talk podcast inspired by the leadership and empowerment team. We formed LET a few months ago with several goals in mind, one being to cultivate campuses that ensure inclusion and equity for students and also allows for those student voices to be heard. So today we'll visit with one of those campus leaders, Kay Velarde, an assistant principal at Shands Elementary. In the interest of helping you understand who we are and our perspectives, we'll introduce ourselves this way. My name is Ted Madden. I'm a video producer for MISD and a 47-year-old white man. And I'm Daniel Norwood, social studies coordinator and a 38-year-old black man. I am Kay Velarde. I am an assistant principal at Shands Elementary, and I am a 49-year-old Hispanic woman. Daniel is also a key member of the leadership and empowerment team, so he'll be joining in on some, some of the discussion points as well. But Kay, before we get started, let's just hear a little bit about your career, how you got from where you started to where you are today. I always um, start with a little joke just because um, I didn't go to college to be a teacher or to be in education. Um, I went to college in my native Peru uh, to be um, uh, in the business world, which I was till I came uh, when I was 30 to the United States. And I wanted to stay here legally. And they said that that was a way that I could be legal if I, wa- if I just became a teacher. And I add as a joke that it was either that or pole dancer in Alaska. So, (laughs) 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 and um, I started um, in Greenville ISD for three years as a first grade bilingual teacher. Then when I came to Mesquite, I was for three years a kindergarten bilingual teacher Then I became um, a bilingual instructional specialist uh, for my campus. I was there for um, nine years in all. And then I was one year at Mackey also as an instructional specialist. That that was when uh, Henry was open. So we really redistributed all the students there. And finally, I am... um, in my starting my fifth year as an assistant principal at Chance, uh, we and we're glad you chose to be an educator and didn't go to Alaska. Um, so, <laughs> Kay, I know you've been involved with the district for some time, and I know you've been an advocate for all kids, uh, but specifically our bilingual populations. Uh, how does the district help students overcome the language barrier? Well, I I have to say that I am really very very happy because. Um, we have moved a long way. When I first came, uh, I was the second kindergarten bilingual in my uh, campus, and we only went to uh, bilingual third grade. So there was one in pre-K, one in uh, two in kinder, two in first, two in second, and one in third. At that time, we had to translate everything like ourselves, uh, sometimes during um, the weekends. I don't know, somehow my translations were kind of good. So then I started getting Diana Martinez, our former um, coordinator of, for bilingual and ESL. She asked us to start translating things. Now I can say that every campus um, does things in both languages. They have personnel that will translate either if it's speaking, sometimes, um, you know, just in writing for any flyers or communication among uh, teachers and parents. And always they are just doing even curriculum and everything. Now it's really greatly um, and very professionally translated. So I think that that is something that has helped parents feel more welcome in the school district. I'm curious to to get more into some of the language barriers that these students face. 
because it's easy for me to understand, okay, if you're teaching a, a lesson in, in reading or in history and you're teaching in English, I've got to be translating in my mind everything. But even in classes like math, there's a translation that goes on that you might not originally, you might not initially think of because you're working with numbers, but those numbers have English words tied to them. And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. And also, Daniel and I talked about this as we prepped for the podcast. Students will have learning issues that have nothing to do with language. And it's probably easy for, easy for a teacher to say, oh, it's just because he or she doesn't understand the language. But, but getting past that to see what another learning issue might be is important. Yes. And uh, regarding that, we also have gone a long way. In the past, any other um, learning difficulty that a student would have, um, first they would think it's a language thing. But now we even have uh, bilingual diagnosticians, so that is really great. Like we, as I say, we're moving along, and that is one of the things uh, why I am very proud of our district. Um, we are always like trying to be inclusive and diverse, and we are learning that we can um, gain more from our differences and not like there's nothing to be scared about because I think that probably fear is one of the things that make us like oh I don't know um, but in math and science it is not as hard to understand as you would think and that is because um, we have lots of um, Latin and Greek roots uh, so many words are what we call uh, cognates, which uh, are words that are kind of spelled the same, kind of sound the same, but most importantly, they mean the same. Uh, for example, triangle and triangulo. So believe it or not, it is easier for um, someone that comes straight from their country where they speak Spanish um, to read, um, I don't know, seventh grade um, or eighth grade science book than to read a kindergartner's book. As a matter of fact, I remember that um, I have studied in a bilingual school since I was in kindergarten. However, um, there are I studied the academic English, so I didn't know how to say soda, for instance, but I could say desoxyribonucleic acid. So those are <laughs> some of the things that language has, because in Spanish it's acido desoxyribonucleico. Mm -hmm. So words are very similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I wanted to ask, too, for, from your perspective, for a student who's just coming to Mesquite and say they are coming from another country, wherever that may be. Um, what's that experience like for a student? I know you've taught quite a few and you've had that experience coming from Peru yourself. What is that like coming into a school? Well, it depends. And really and truly, um, I think that this gives me uh, the opportunity to say that Hispanic or uh, Latinos, we are more than just Mexicans. We come from very different countries. Like there are 10 in South America. Um, there's a bunch in Central America as well. The thing is that depending on the country you come from, your Spanish varies a little bit. So sometimes it's hard to understand what others are speaking, although they're speaking Spanish. I don't know if that makes sense, mm -hmm. but I would say that that happens with people from um, Great Britain or Australia with English. You might have different um, like dialects, uh, dialects uh -huh. uh, and stuff. So that is one thing. And it is funny because I remember when I was at Gray, there was a um, pre-K teacher that was Colombian. I was the kindergarten teacher. I was, um, per, well, I am Peruvian. There's, there was this teacher in first grade. Uh, she was Mexican, and there was a second grade teacher, Argentinian. So for a jacket, the Colombian would say chaqueta, and I would say casaca, 
and the Mexican would say chamarra, and the Argentinian would say campera. So some of them learn more than just plain Spanish, but they learn some um, things that are um, related to the region they come. If you come educated or not educated, that's another thing. Like when my daughter came with me, she was five. She um, had gone in, in Peru to pre-K and kinder, and she had only one week. It was hard for her because when we just came, we were in Las Vegas, and the bilingual school was exactly in the opposite side of the city where I lived. So I just say, okay, I can help her. Let's do that ESL thing that I didn't know because... As I say, it wasn't until I came to Mesquite, well, not to Mesquite, to Texas, that I decided to be uh, a teacher. So I had no clue. I just said I can help her. And for a week, because of the help of the parent, dad knew the language because my husband didn't know any English. Um, she um, would get there. Um, it was very funny, one thing. She realized that if she said, really? And smiled and then just follow up whatever the others were doing. She was fine. So the kids were like, blah, 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 blah. And, and she was really? And smile. And the kids, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. So my husband said, oh, that's a great idea. I will do the same. And she said, daddy, don't forget to smile. That's the key. <laughs> and he did. And um, he was talking to... Um, technician and mechanic um, at Pep Boys and the mechanic started saying blah 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 and he didn't understand and he was like really? and smile mm -hmm. and rah, 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 really? well finally he was um, explaining how his wife died in his arms and my husband was oh, like no. really? and smiling <laughs> so it doesn't it yep. does not always work <laughs> Now, you know, and, and just touching on what you just said, I, I did want to ask that question about how our campuses do engage parents because, you know, we often think of, hey, the barriers our students have. Uh, but I know when it comes to parents and, and visiting the school and coming up there and talking to the principal, uh, I know there, there can be barriers that prevent that as well. And they play such a, a huge role in what we do. Uh, so what can a campus do? to make it more engaging and more welcoming for parents? Well, I think, as I said, that here in Mesquite, we are doing those things. Mm -hmm. The first um, and very important thing is that we have um, at the front desk someone that speaks Spanish. So they um, can talk um, and ask any questions without the fear of not pronouncing uh, the words well or something like that. Also, we are uh, providing translations for everything that's written, not only flyers or letters, but also um, electronic um, things like an email or just something on the website or in a, our Facebook page. So that is very important. And also, at Chance, we do something called the Latino Family Literacy Project, um, that's something that I have done since um, year one. I was here uh, in Mesquite. And it's 10 sessions that we talk to parents for two hours about how to help their kids um, at home. And I think that that's very important. Sometimes parents do want to help, but they don't know how to help. So if you just teach them the way that things are um, done in school, it's like they will be very grateful and you will see that reflected on the performance of their kids. And that is something that I have uh, experienced um, for 15 years. And it's something that um, it's very important. And when we educate the parents, then the parents can do more things. For instance, every time that I learn something new, I would add it to what I was telling the parents. At the beginning, it was a script that I had to, but over the years, I have made it mine. And I add, if we are learning now this way, okay, this is the way that we need to, to tell the parents to help. And 
one very important thing is making them aware of the summer slide because that is something that if you are not in, in the education world, you don't have a clue what the summer slide is. And if they are aware that if they don't read to their kids or just give them books to read during the summer or take them to museums, et cetera, et cetera, they will be behind the peers that do have those um, experiences. And really and truly nowadays, it's just knowing it because it's available for them. It's not something that you can not do. Yes, you cannot travel to Europe every summer, but you can virtually travel to Europe. You know, there are things like that. So I think that it's very important to um, make parents aware um, of how important it is for them to start reading to their kids since they are very young, uh, because if they don't, they will be very behind and it will be very hard to catch up. You know, for parents who are reading to their kids at a young age, does the book need to be in English or could it be in English or Spanish? Well, it depends on the family, really. Hmm. If it's a family that they don't speak any um, English at all, then it's okay for them to read in Spanish because why do we use Spanish here? And that's sometimes that's a question that um, I have heard and sometimes like, People are kind of like upset why we are learning two languages when their kids are not learning two languages. And we are not really learning Spanish. We know Spanish. We are just using Spanish to learn things, which is different than learning a language. So if you, um, the good thing with Spanish and English is that um, they are, uh, very similar. You l read from left to right, from top to bottom. We have um, almost like almost all the same uh, letters of the alphabet. Um, and so we can do um, like uh, the transition to another, la to the other language um, easy if we keep just helping the kids to grasp concepts. For example, I remember in, in kindergarten, you are not supposed to do guided reading groups in English. Um, so one day I had this kindergartner that went to the nurse and the nurse had a poster and the kindergartner started reading it and it was in English. So she said, in what grade are you? And he said, Kinder, uh, who's your teacher? Miss Velarde, no, you had that poster at home, right? No, no, it's the first time. Mm, okay, come here, read this, and come here, read that. So he would read all these things, but then she would be like, how can you do that? So she went all, like, happy for him, but she said, how have you taught him? And he is, like, not only um, reading, but pronouncing really well, and I said, I didn't teach him to read in English. I taught him to read in Spanish. Now, he has older siblings. So the older siblings do the talking at home, mostly in English, because it's more easy for them, because that's what they get everywhere else. So that's how he was able, like, yes, on we do uh, the 50-50 model, or, and on um, English days, I would say, like, um, I would go, over the letters, over the sounds, and over words. But guidance reading was not like that. But they knew and they understood just because they were um, transferring. Um, and really, Spanish is such tr a transparent language that it's very, very, very easy to do that. I want to bring this back to LED because the district formed the leadership and empowerment team in June. From the committee standpoint, they've got to worry about it at the district level, at the campus level, at the classroom level. So, Daniel, I'll start with you, but leading into to Kay, mm -hmm. you know, on a campus level, you know, what concrete things is LET doing to help make sure all these students get an equal chance at an education? One of the biggest things that we're doing is, is in the professional learning side. Uh, and so we'll talk to Jennifer Morris, but it's it's teacher training so that they understand, like, 
you know, the importance of books, the importance of affirmation. Um, we've done s- several book studies now which talk about race, uh, but you know, when you start talking about race, you get into culture, you get into ethnicities, you get into a lot of different nuanced conversations that I don't think we should traditionally had. Uh, and, and so, in you know, in Kay's case, what she's talking about now is, is specifically the language barrier and the uh, processes that we put into place. And you can tell over the last probably, what, 15, 20 years uh, that we've made great strides. I know as social studies coordinator, we have uh, quite a few resources that they're, they're always translated English and Spanish. Uh, and now I think we're getting to the point where, all right, now what, what books are you using in class? You know, are your books Dr. Seuss or, you know, do they affirm students of all ethnicities? Uh, and so just kind of like this conversation where Kay is bringing up, hey, you know, we, I worked with a Colombian teacher. A, I'm a Peruvian. Uh, there's a Mexican teacher there. It's digging into those details of culture, I think, that will take us to that next level for our kids. Yes, and I am a little bit sad that um, we are um, living this pandemic right now Mm -hmm. because uh, this is the month for Hispanic heritage, and we um, we like to um, do several events for students to be proud of who they are and of their roots. You know, um, I don't know where I read that. like something like uh, a tree uh, with branches and very big always needs to remember where the roots were, mm-hmm. you know. So sure. that is something that I, I just really think that it's very important. And you also need to be willing to learn about other cultures as well um, because uh, it is not only, oh, this is my culture and I know my culture. Because also uh, as a Hispanic, I had to learn things that white people would do, things that black people would do within their cultures. And sometimes ignorance is what gets you in trouble. I have been in trouble twice for saying things I shouldn't have said, but I didn't have any like intention to be mean, rude, or to offend anybody, but I didn't know better, and I just said them. Now I I know that I cannot say some words, and it's a learning process. So I think that we need to be open as well to to think that um, we are all learning, and we can make mistakes, and we need to give grace to people when they are honestly making a mistake. But then also you have to stand uh, for yourself and for others when you see that there are things that um, are not right. When I was in the classroom, I had, I think I, North Mesquite was probably about 60 percent uh, Hispanic, you know, Latino. And I'm always proud to see my former students uh, in education. And I know we have several now in the district, I think just, you know, just based on our our um, our racial demographic changes over the last 15 to 20 years, we've seen the classroom change also, our teachers. Uh, but what's going to allow our, our, our teachers now to take that next step? How do we get more uh, Latino leaders in the district, more Hispanic leaders in the district uh, at the level that you are as, as assistant principal? Well, I think that um, that is really more um, a matter of not education, because I think that we are very capable and prepared, but I think it's more you wanting to do something um, in that um, like capacity, because we have now the ETIP program that is um, for excellent teachers to stay as teachers. Sometimes even now, after this many years, I miss being in the classroom. And I came by accident, but it was the most wonderful accident that happened to me because mm-hmm. that was my true calling in life. And also, I think will depend on, um, like, whoever makes the decision to, um, like, give those um, positions to others to try to um, be more, like according to our populations, if you think about it, um, like 
we have very large Hispanic uh, population. Probably it's the largest mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. district. However, you don't see that um, neither in assistant principals or principals or like um, even higher than that. The, there's a few, but um, we can probably do more. And it's from both sides, I believe. Okay, thanks for coming in. We appreciate the conversation. You're welcome. Thank you. That's Shan's assistant principal, Kay Velarde. Next week, we'll visit with Mesquite principal, Gerald Sarpy, who, like Daniel, is also a member of the LET committee. For Daniel Norwood, I'm Ted Madden. Let's talk again next week. 